thank you for, thank you for joining us for the fall report. Um, here's the outline for our presentation this morning. I'm going to start by providing uh, an update on enrollment, our budget, and fundraising. I also want to speak to you about our new five-year strategic plan and a special initiative we developed over the summer called LaGuardia English Express. Our provost, Dr. Billy Gastic Rosado, will give her report from the Division of Academic Affairs. Next, we'll hear from Ben Roden, Vice President of Enrollment Management, followed by Dr. Alexis McLean, our new Vice President of Student Affairs. We will wrap up with news from Sunil Gupta, Vice President of the Division of Adult and Continuing Education, or ACE. Let me start by introducing Jason Farr and Sean Trainer castle the American Sign Language interpreters who are going to interpret for my colleagues and me this morning. Thank you both very much. First enrollment. I'm pleased to confirm the rumors that yes, enrollment is up this semester at LaGuardia. In fact, how about that? Thank you members of our live studio audience. Uh, <laughs> In fact, it's up for the first time in nine years since 2014. Ben is going to give you the details when he comes up here to the podium in a few minutes, but I want to share several observations about this with you. First, rising enrollment, this is kind of obvious, but it's important, rising enrollment is essential for reducing our structural budget deficit that I've spoken to you about in the past. Our enrollment growth arrives at a critical time because the federal government uh, has ended the COVID relief stimulus payments that frankly kept CUNY afloat during the pandemic. We must increase our revenue and rising enrollment enables us to do that through increased tuition income, mostly by means of our students' financial aid, uh, and increased state subsidies driven by FTEs, basically the number of credits pursued by our LaGuardia students. And I mention FTEs to remind us that for financial purposes, they're more important than the headcount. Second, our enrollment growth didn't happen by accident. I want to take a moment to recognize our colleagues in admissions, student financial services, the registrar, the welcome center and student information center, international student services, new student engagement, and testing. And while we're at it, let's thank the bursar, marketing and communications, uh, and of course, academic affairs, home to our advisors. Speaking of advisors, you may recall that shortly after Billy started, we moved advising from student affairs to academic affairs. Remember, our advisors play a critical role in onboarding new students, but they also are fundamental when it comes to assisting continuing students and increasing our retention. Faculty, of course, also serve as advisors, and we have to recognize the important role th that they play in that capacity in increasing student retention and therefore overall enrollment. All of these colleagues across three divisions of LaGuardia have been working very hard to turn our enrollment picture around, and they're succeeding. Congratulations and thank you. Now, let's not forget that all of us, in the end, all of us, faculty, staff, and administrators play a part in increasing LaGuardia's enrollment. We all interact with students in different ways, uh, and in those interactions, classes and meetings, events, conversations, we make prospective students and enrolled students feel welcomed, valued, respected, and supported. And that makes LaGuardia a special and compelling place for students who are applying to college and for students who are just a few courses away from their graduation. This success will not be easy to maintain. Nothing is guaranteed. None of this is automatic. We're going to have to work hard and thoughtfully to sustain LaGuardia's enrollment recovery. And remember, we're facing several headwinds. The number of high school graduates in New York City continues to fall. Enrollment in CUNY colleges is down, in the senior colleges is down this semester. That's going to lead some of them to recruit students that are on the fence, those who were thinking about going to a community college but haven't made their minds up yet. We call that fishing in our pond. Another headwind, economic conditions. Economic conditions that can derail a low-income student's dreams of going to college. Specifically, high inflation and the high cost of living in New York City, especially housing costs, which can force a student to apply for a job instead of applying to go to college. 
It's a highly competitive student marketplace out there, made more challenging by today's national conversation over the value proposition of a college education, the is college worth it question, debated tonight at homes all across this country and right here in Queens. I hope you all read Paul Tuff's article in the New York Times Magazine on September 5th. It's called, Americans are losing faith in the value of college. Whose fault is that? A sobering assessment of the state of higher education in the U.S., Tuff's piece lays bare the financial risks for many students thinking about going to college. His view is hardly radical. According to the Hetchinger Report, when Gallup started asking Americans about their confidence in higher education in 2015, 57% of respondents gave college a solid thumbs up. When they asked the same question this past June, confidence in college had dropped to 36%, the lowest level ever. Meanwhile, the percentage of Gallup's respondents that had very little confidence in college more than doubled. Let's face it, Americans have lost, Americans are souring or have soured on college. Well, maybe not community college. Consider this. Enrollment is up this fall at many community colleges across the country. LaGuardia is not alone. And while one semester's data, one semester's data is no basis for bold projections, I, I'm optimistic. And I'm optimistic because I believe community colleges are the answer to the id's college worth it question. Why? Our tuitions are lower than private or public four-year schools, so the bet that Paul Tuff describes in his article is less risky. We align many of our programs with employers' needs, which increases career success for our graduates. Community colleges like LaGuardia offer advising, mentoring, and other forms of support not found on many four-year campuses. Aspiring, hardworking students, many foreign-born and first-gen, attract faculty for whom teaching comes first. Liberal arts students can get the first half of that BA in English at a deep discount and then transfer to a four-year school. You all know the advantages of a community college. When we look at this fall's enrollment data from around the country, it appears that families and students across the nation are starting to catch on. Yes, community colleges can help restore America's confidence in higher education. Now for the budget update. Big thanks, of course, to uh, Shahir Irfan, our Senior Vice President for Administration and Finance, for providing the information I'm going to share here. Because of our rising enrollment and continued belt tightening on the expense side, our deficit is shrinking. But we still have a long way to go to eliminate it and meet CUNY's reserve targets. Each year, CUNY requires all colleges to submit a five-year financial plan. We submitted LaGuardia's plan about two weeks ago, and it was approved. We projected annual FTE growth of 4% for this year, FY24, and 3% for each of the following three years. Now, this growth should increase our revenue by $3.8 million this year alone. To reduce our expenses, we plan to continue generating payroll savings, by carefully managing vacancies, as we've been doing since the pandemic. In FY24, these savings should be about $3.5 million. Unfortunately, despite these efforts to increase our revenue and reduce our expenses, we're still facing a projected deficit of $6 million for this year, 2024. You can see it in the slide. We're projecting revenue this year of approximately $131 million against expenses of about $137 million, which results, obviously, in a deficit of $6 million. Now, it is our hope that CUNY will allow us to access funds held in the Stabilization Reserve to cover this year's gap. This will enable us to end the year on June 30th, technically, with a balanced budget. But we have a steep hill to climb to eliminate our structural operating deficit. We'll, we will continue to implement our self-imposed belt tightening measures as well as those that are required of us by CUNY. The VRB, or Vacancy Review Board, remains in place to control staff hiring. The college's business office will continue to, to monitor non-personnel expenses and will limit purchases to essential items. To the many of you who are working with fewer people on your teams or are putting up with an old piece of equipment, I am really sorry. 
But the pandemic greatly accelerated a decline in enrollment that had begun back in 2014. And this led to a precipitous drop uh, in revenue against high fixed costs and thus, as you know, our deficit. So we have to manage our revenue expenses to eliminate the deficit and get back on firm financial footing. This is fundamental for the future of our college. Thank you for your understanding, your patience, and your support. Now, mindful of the limitations of our tax levy support from the city and the state, we continue to work very hard on fundraising. Jay Golan and his team in the, La in the LaGuardia Foundation, led by our board chair, Charles Boyce, are in constant pursuit of gifts from generous individuals to fund scholarships, emergency aid, stipends for internships, and on-campus employment. Last year, the LaGuardia Foundation provided almost $8 million to 6,000 students uh, in degree as well as ACE programs. This year, we'll make about $6 million in foundations award to our students. This is double the average amount we used to provide to students before we completed the $15 million Tomorrow campaign. Seen another way, last year, we provided more foundation-generated foundation support for our LaGuardia students than any of the other CUNY community colleges. All right, except maybe for BMCC. We're not sure because they haven't turned in their numbers yet. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll be ahead. Laura Bartovics and her team in the Office of Grants and Sponsored Programs aggressively seek grants and contracts from foundations and government agencies. They collaborate with faculty and staff in search of funding for special programs, initiatives, and research. Laura and her team have had some incredible success lately. One way to measure this is just looking back over the last few years. In 2018, they raised about $17 million in grants, which is phenomenal for a community college. In the fiscal year ending back on June 30th, FY23, they raised a jaw-dropping $28 million in one year. That's more than $2 million a month. A 60% increase in just five years and during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's incredible. And by the way, who doesn't like a line graph that looks like this? <laughs> Finally, we pursue capital funding from elected and government officials, including the mayor, our president, city council, to improve our campus facilities. And yeah, fix the leaky roof. Uh, much of our success on that front is thanks to Claudia Chan, Dir Deputy Director of Government and, uh, Relations and External Affairs and Senior Vice President Shahir Irfan. Okay, a couple last things. Our new five-year strategic plan. Yes, it is that time again. Our current five-year strategic plan expires next spring. So this fall, we will form a steering committee and ask for volunteers to serve on various subcommittees that will explore specific aspects of the plan. We want to get the process started next month, but much of the research, analysis, and planning will occur in the spring from March to May, and we'll publish the final plan in June right before graduation. If any of you are interested in helping out, please send me a note. LaGuardia and the Asylum Seekers. You all know this story. More than 110,000 asylum seekers have arrived in New York City over the past year. Most of them fleeing life-threatening poverty and public safety conditions in their home countries of Central and South America. Their plight is one of the greatest humanitarian emergencies our city has ever faced. So how can we help? This summer, John Hunt, Assistant Dean for Pre-College Academic Programs, with colleagues Liz Ayanada de Telk and Paula da Silva Michel of the CIET, came up with a solution, LaGuardia English Express, a program featuring language and literacy assessment, introductory English workshops, GED prep and testing, job training, and additional resettlement assistance. Here's how it works. Following orientation and assessment, asylum seekers will enroll in highly contextualized English language workshops. These free two-hour evening sessions will focus on essential topics of daily living, including, for example, finding an apartment and talking to a landlord, talking about your skills and getting a job, speaking to teachers and administrators at your child's school, talking about your health, wellness, stress, and anxiety. Asylum speakers may repeat a workshop as often as they want to, and they can take as many different workshops from that menu uh, as they need. The program coordinator, case managers, and ESOL instructors will provide ongoing guidance to, to asylum seekers regarding education and workforce training possibilities here at LaGuardia. 
Asylum seekers who are able to speak, read, and write English at an intermediate level or higher and have a recognized high school diploma or equivalent from their country or origin will be encouraged to enroll in degree or workforce training programs at LaGuardia. Asylum seekers without high school diploma or equivalent will be encouraged to enroll in the college's GED prep courses, which we offer in English and Spanish. As you may have heard, on September 6th, the mayor announced that the city will open a new shelter for asylum seekers just four blocks from here, over on Austell Place. While the mayor's efforts to open emergency shelters across the city have been met with NIMBY opposition, I have voiced our full support for the new Austell Place facility. And I've proposed that LaGuardia be the city's partner in providing education and training to the asylum seekers, those staying at Austell Place right nearby or at any other facility. I've had several conversations with the mayor office, mayor's office and other elected officials about this, confirming LaGuardia's commitment to help these new immigrants. We're currently trying to raise the money to hire a program manager and pay our instructors, and I'll let you know what happens. But I hope you agree with me that this is the right thing to do. It's our obligation. And of course, our namesake would have it no other way. Okay, let me pass the microphone on now to our provost, Dr. Billy Gastic Rosado. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to start with a few highlights from the late spring and summer. At the suggestion of faculty and chairs, class caps in English and social sciences were reduced, um, and those took effect this fall. In English, we focused on first-year composition courses to increase students' ability to benefit from, student fee uh, from faculty feedback. And in the social sciences, we prioritized those classes where caps were much higher than typical for the college, many close to 40. We also announced the start of the Office for Experiential and Global Learning, which launched this fall under faculty co-leaders Ch uh, Tuli Chatterjee and Olga Ak Aksakalova. As they embark on a process to develop a vision for the office, the driving goal will be to connect and build upon the excellent work that's already happening across LaGuardia. Bittersweet summer news was that our assistant dean for student advising, Ramon De Los Santos, left LaGuardia to become an AVP for student affairs at City College. A search committee is putting, being put together now so we can fill this critical leadership position as soon as possible. Finally, we are making important strides with communicating and collaborating cross-divisionally. One example of this is that we only canceled 20 classes this semester. This is due to a coordinated effort between program directors, coordinators, department chairs, and enrollment management. Indeed, because of that dialogue, we added nearly as many new sections of other courses as we canceled because programs and departments responded quickly in the face of data about incoming students' needs, and I'm appreciative, appreciative of, all of all of those efforts. Looking ahead to this year, academic affairs is focused on making unique progress in three areas. First, we will look at students' transition to college. Research and students themselves tell us how critical their first semester is to setting the tone for the rest of their time at college. And there are a lot of decisions that students need to make quickly. These decisions, if made with information that is incomplete or hard to understand, or when students feel rushed, are generally not the best. This year, we will work on enhancing the guidance that students receive as they enter their own individual pathway to college. In many instances, this will mean starting that research even before their first day of class. Student affairs and enrollment management will be critical partners in that work. We also recognize that student success is shaped by students' engagement with our campus more broadly and all of the opportunities and supports that are available. As such, we want to help students learn this for themselves by providing them with an important set of milestones to strive for each semester and giving them feedback along the way. These are intended to guide students to make the most of their time at LaGuardia. Another area that we're going to spend a lot of time on is making LaGuardia more accessible. We will work to address unintentional barriers that our policies, procedures, and systems might put in front of students 
and in front of faculty and staff in their work with students. We will also advance our ongoing OER, Open Educational Resources work, and support departmental efforts to continue to lead CUNY in this area. In doing all of this, we will be particularly mindful of our part-time students so that our decisions are informed by their needs as they make up about half of our student body and have different challenges than full-time students. This year, we will also see additional progress made on the recommendations of the Senate's Online Learning Committee. We recognize the richness of an online learning experience for students, but know that flexibility can make the difference for a student being able to achieve their degree. As a college, we have come a long way to provide a healthy balance of choice of modality for students. In fact, this past spring, our classes were 64% fully in person, 12% hybrid, and 24% fully online. This general two-thirds in person, one-third hybrid or online is what the president and I have agreed is optimal for the college right now. This year, we will focus on making sure that our use of technology continues to improve, expand, and extend learning opportunities and success for all students. Finally, addressing transfer barriers is also a matter of accessibility. We want students to have the information they need early on to make the right decision for themselves. Faculty, programs, and departments will be essential to identifying ways that we can promote a more seamless transfer for students and increase the number of credits they complete here that will count toward their bachelor's degree. Advisors are also critical to ensuring that students know how to find the information they need when it comes to planning their transfer, even when that's in their first semester at LaGuardia. Earlier, the better. Indeed, because faculty and staff are equal partners in this, we will soon launch the Transfer Advising Council, co-chaired by Julianne Salazar, the Director of College Discovery, and Misun Doko, English faculty, who also serves as the Senate's co-chair on transfer. The council meets for the first time next week, and we will share a list of members and the scope of their work in an upcoming campus update. The third major area of attention will be professional community. Academic affairs will be taking stock of the ways that we support, develop, and promote faculty and staff into new roles and professional opportunities. Fortunately, we have the benefit of the coach survey results, which you can now find in the faculty portal. And we will find other ways to learn from staff about their needs and experiences. I see the newly formed Staff Council as playing an important role in this. I want to take this time to thank the Coach Steering Committee, led by Rochelle Isaac, for their work over the past several months to get us to this point. We will be dedicating the Fall Instructional Staff Meeting on November 1st to discussing coach results and next steps. In closing, I know that we do better work when we work together in ways that acknowledge and respect our varied talents, perspectives, and experiences. As a college, we are united in our commitment to do our best for students, and I look forward to all of the ways that we will continue to keep pushing forward on our shared mission this year. Thank you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm Ben Roden. I'm the Vice President of Enrollment Management. Uh, and I thought I'd share a little bit more detail from some of the things that President Adams uh, shared earlier. So um, while it is a horribly rainy day outside, um, I think this fall, in my mind, is going to be very, very sunny. I think, you know, and some of the data that we'll share with you now um, <clears throat> should confirm that. So. These are our numbers for this fall as of uh, just a few days ago. Um, and I wanted to share some of this breakdown here just so you can get a sense of not just that our numbers are up, but that I think we're seeing uh, healthy trends throughout kind of the, the enrollment picture. Um, we're seeing growth not just in new students coming in, new freshmen, new transfers, but we're also seeing growth in our continuing students, which last year was one of the things that was particularly challenging for the college which means that we're going to see upticks in persistence and retention rates kind of in the, in the next semester and so. 
Uh, we're also seeing more students re-engage with us, readmit to the college that might have stopped out during the pandemic. And also we're seeing slight upticks in our kind of full-time equivalents uh, enrollment for non-degree students. You know, I, I point out that the far, the bottom right-hand corner of up 5.2%, these are full-time equivalent students. This is not, we've engaged students and they're taking a couple of classes. These are, stu this, this enrollment is, you know, solid and healthy um, for the college. So I think worth pointing out. We had a good fall also in admissions. Our applications were up about 4% overall. Um, and I think that's very encouraging. Um, and, and I would also just point out that while we're up 5.2%, the university overall is up about 1%. Uh, President Adams mentioned that the senior colleges are actually slightly down, but community colleges and the comprehensive colleges have kind of been leading the push here to, to what I'm, I think we're discovering is a kind of a, a recovery year for CUNY in general. So how do we get here? Um, a lot of work went into getting us here. Uh, the last six months has been particularly busy in the enrollment management uh, shop. Uh, this summer, the entire team rolled up their sleeves and we really kind of buckled down on really turning over every stone we could to see where there were opportunities for us to kind of improve primarily student experience um, in the application process, but also the onboarding process. Um, and so I will just echo the appreciation and, and gratitude to all the people in enrollment management and also student affairs and in academic affairs who kind of made this possible. It really was a coordinated effort across the board. And I think something that we're be beginning to build into as a model for moving forward in terms of like a baseline of cross collaborative, cross divisional collaborations. Some of the other, thing, other things we did is we looked very closely at the application process for students. You know, we actually operate within CUNY's application kind of framework, but there are certainly steps that we, we, we can sit there and make that experience more efficient and more um, kind of seamless for students. And so the admissions teams, and particularly I'd like to shout out a lot of the unsung heroes in the application processing area. They sit in the back offices, they process <clears throat> thousands, 26,000 applications a year for the institution, and they were able to kind of find efficiencies in their process, and it really helped us get students to the point where they could meet with their advisors faster and had more time to kind of make those plans for the fall semester. So I really wanted to shout them out because their work has been extraordinary this summer. We've been working very closely on kind of looking at our communications and outreach efforts. If I had to describe my observations of her six months, and this is kind of a CUNY observation, I would say also that we share, is that we're, we've been excellent at explaining to students how to become a college student, but we haven't done as much talking about why you should be a college student. This echoes some of the, some of the, the, um, the article that uh, President Adams mentioned about what's, why, what, what's the value in a college degree. We need to start telling that story. And so we've begun to start to re-examine some of the communications that we, we put out there to students as we're onboarding them. Um, uh, Provost Gazek Rosado has also mentioned kind of strong uh, collaborations between our divisions. This is going to have to be a constant, you know, moving forward. The work is so intertwined that I think this is a baseline, and I really saw these two divisions come together and work very seamlessly this year. In fact, um, well, I'll preview something else in a moment. So, and then lastly, one of the things we looked at, we began early on in the summer <clears throat> looking deeply at student accounts to see what obstacles our students were facing in terms of being able to kind of progress in their degree plan. In fact, we received outreach from our um, local union chapter as well that, that they also had concerns that students were unable to kind of progress because of unnecessary holds on their accounts. So the President Adams, myself, and, and uh, Vice President Arafan started looking at the student accounts in, in a deeper way, and some really interesting things started to come out. I mean, we, we focused primarily on students in good standing with medium-sized balances, and you know, what, what is the state of that student population? And what we found was some of it was kind of alarming. We saw real disproportionate effects, you know, when you look at them by race and ethnicity. In particular, our black student population, um, students Oh, we're on our lists for collections and for outstanding balances at disproportionately larger uh, numbers than the rest of our student population. And it drove us, that among other reasons, drove us to start to really look at our thresholds in which we will prevent students from moving forward, as well as dropping them for non-enrollment. And we did make those adjustments as one of a number of different th things we're looking at to try to help students stay on track from a financial perspective, in addition to augmenting financial aid counseling, 
financial literacy programs, and, and really necessary academic supports because many of our students who struggle financially correlate highly with those who are struggling academically. So moving on, um, I, I wanted to show, I like visuals, so I wanted to <laughs> share a visual for what President Adams mentioned earlier, that this is the first time in really, uh, you know, nine, ten years that we have seen an increase in enrollment. LaGuardia being the red line at the bottom, um, the grayish line being the, the other community colleges at CUNY, and the bars being the overall degree-seeking student population at CUNY. And so you can see everybody has experienced decline during this period of time, and everyone is, is rebounding this fall. So we are seeing some shifts in the enrollment market, but this is, I think, really a moment to celebrate um, the kind of bottoming out of our enrollment, we hope. Uh, I'm, I, I am, uh, by nature, a conservative when I start to put, put these kind of projections out there, but, but I'm feeling cautiously optimistic that this is the bottom. There are a lot of things that I've seen in my work here that make me really optimistic that we can start to drive enrollment and, uh, you know, in the years to come. And I just want to talk a little bit about um, what to look forward to this fall and beyond. So most importantly, when the college starts to engage in their strategic planning process, we will in parallel start a strategic enrollment planning process, which is also a consensus building process. It's really important that we have a lot of buy-in and a lot of the initiatives and strategies we need to put in place to drive enrollment for the, for the college and make sure that we're all kind of comfortable with where we're going. I think it will, it, it's an important piece of the puzzle. And so that having a formal strategic enrollment plan, but one that isn't just about new students, one that is encompassing the work that happens in the ACE division, one that's encompassing of retention and student success work, so that really we can have a plan that interweaves a lot of the work that we're doing on, on, to drive overall enrollment. But really, above all, the one thing that I've been stressing with my team and I think is already kind of core in their being is we need to focus on all of these enrollment experiences that our students have through their eyes. So improving the student experience being the number one reason. And it's a big reason why students will leave us too. So I think you know, what we can do to kind of really streamline our processes and improve the way we're working with them, more personalized attention, um, it is really gonna be a focus for us. In fact, many of my staff are not here today because last Friday we kind of soft launched a virtual one-stop office for the college. So at the moment, most of my staff are, are working in in a Zoom room, meeting with students, um, and providing um, a, a kind of a one-stop environment for students to get any of the needs taken care of, whether it be admissions, financial aid, registrar, um, bursar, you know, you name it. Students go in there and they can be moved around to meet with people and get immediate attention. The focus for us and from the student experience is that we provide clear, consistent, and responsive student services, and that is going to be the focus moving forward. One of the things that I talk a lot about is making sure that while enrollment management as a division is an umbrella organization of, so of sorts, where we're looking at overall how all the different things of the college impact our overall enrollment, but it, at its core, we're a service organization and primarily in the service of the academic mission of the institution. So I've been talking with program directors and, uh, and department chairs, and I have many more to, to meet with, but. This is the core of the work that we do, is making sure they understand that we are there to help support their, their priorities. And this is something that we will continue to work on through all those discussions moving, moving forward and through our planning processes. Um, strengthening our core, our core market positions. This is important to us. You know, you know it's a reality to every, every college, but there are 10 to 20 programs that represent a vast majority of your enrollment, and I think Many, much of our enrollment comes from a handful of different geo markets, and I think these are places where we need to focus on kind of working with our students and our prospective students to understand that what the options are here at, at LaGuardia, and to make sure that we shore up those markets, because that's the foundation which we build all other initiatives from an enrollment perspective on. But in addition, we need to start to explore other opportunities, other enrollment markets, and these will be some of the discussions we have in our planning processes, because we can't just go off and make, make up, you know, we would love to be over in this market, but if it doesn't, if it's not consistent with our mission and our values, then it's something that we, we probably don't want to pursue. 
And I think so those conversations about new markets, there's going to be something that we actively engage with this fall as well. Um, and lastly, really, enrollment management continuing to provide a supportive uh, framework around systems and technology and communications and identifying funding gap opportunity and issues for students and providing that support in the, in the interest of driving retention and student success initiatives as well. And with that, I am very much looking forward to all the conversations to have. I, like, I will just underscore, it is a sunny fall and we are feeling very good about it. So thank you very much. My three goals for this semester are goal number one, to improve access to essential housing resources by expanding community partnerships. Goal number two, to expand food insecurity by providing free nutritious meals to students. And goal number three, to empower students with the knowledge and skills to manage their finances effectively by partnering with NYC Financial Empowerment Center. We have a few goals for our department. Number one is to expand the clinical placements to really enrich the students' experiences here at the college. Number two is to focus and expand enrollment to address the critical healthcare shortage. And number three, we're working hard to develop new programs and pathways that really utilize students' prior experiences and skills that they come in so we can give them credit for those experiences and speed them along to their pathway to a degree. Thank you. My first goal is to provide services for migrant youth who have recently arrived in New York City and are residing within the five boroughs, but particularly in Queens. My second goal is for the college community to be more involved in providing internships and services for our summer youth employment program participants for 2024. And my third goal would be to increase our numbers significantly by 500 to have 4,000 young people on LaGuardia's campus for 2024 as well. My three goals for this semester, uh, the first is um, I, I would love to have a student veteran uh, club. The second is uh, I'd love for, for us to continue our community outreach. Uh, and third, I think um, huge, a huge thing is informing our faculty and staff uh, of, of how the issues that veterans face. Uh, that way that the, they, they understand the challenges that, that veterans might be going through. My three goals for this semester are goal number one, to improve access to essential housing resources by expanding community partnerships. Goal number two, to expand food insecurity by providing free nutritious meals to students. And goal number three, to empower students with the knowledge and skills. Making observations that would ultimately inform the way forward. As many of you may know, on any college campus, Student Affairs is primarily responsible for services, programming, and crisis management. Over the summer, we identified the following needs as they pertain to each area. With respect to services, we want to ensure that they are expanded in ways that consistently account for student demographics and LaGuardia's rich history and mission. This is really related to who our students are, what they want, and what they respond to but we want to ensure that that is aligned with the college's focus on strengthening community and developing socially responsible citizens. With respect to programming, we discovered that we needed to re-envision internal and external partnerships and market programming via a wide range of mechanisms. Due to challenges with staffing, it's been difficult to put forth the manpower that is needed to ensure student affairs has robust offerings. Many of you may know that the Wellness Center lost several staff members when the federal stimulus funding ended. We have two new hires in the pipeline and others who were recently credentialed. So we have taken steps in the right direction or steps toward righting the ship, so to speak. However, staffing remains a concern for the entire division and has a direct impact on the quantity and quite frankly, the quality of our programming. The last area of focus, crisis management, taught us that we need to increase communication regarding how crises are managed 
and restructure how community members are informed and supported. There are a number of proactive educative processes that were not consistently taking place. And during the fa past few months, I gained a better understanding about how this impacted members of the campus community. Overall, the insight I gained about the coordination of services, facilitation of programming, and response to crises really served as a foundation for goals that were set for the upcoming year. That brings me to these goals and the corresponding plan for each area of focus. We have, con we have instituted a communications plan that markets and highlights services, resources and programming via the alignment of email, website, and social media promotion and the widespread availability of key information. For example, we have begun to use social media analytics to determine when our messaging can reach a critical mass of students, but that will be supported by widespread and consistent email communication and website placement. Some of you may have already seen the LaGuardia Cares and Veteran Services spotlights that were on the web not too long ago. Daryl Griffin, who manages our Veteran Services office, is here, and I want to take this opportunity, Daryl, to thank you for all of the tremendous work that you have done and continue to do for our student veterans at LaGuardia Community College. You may have also seen information about our Mental Health 101 series that is the result of our new partnership with NAMI, also known as the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And as far as the widespread availability of key information, we have worked alongside communications, who I affectionately refer to as comms, to revamp our new student guide and create a student hub and we are in the process of reactivating monitor usage throughout the campus. As I have stated time and time again, we really want to ensure that student affairs is as pervasive as possible on the LaGuardia Community College campus. Our second goal is a data collection plan. We will implement data utilization methods to inform the production of programming, revision of processes, and implementation of po policy. For example, we have already done this to amend how we onboard students via new student orientation. This past summer, we included departmental informational sessions into our program and data analyses indicated that students overwhelmingly found this segment helpful and necessary. As a result, we are moving forward with the intent to permanently include this. We have also begun utilizing student concern data to tailor our outreach to relevant stakeholders about the themes that emerge via this data, and we plan on using it to inform the tightening up of policies and practices that have a direct impact on the student experience. The last goal, our crisis response plan, will focus on the creation and revision of committee structures that will be addressed in four ways. The first is a coordinated and proactive response to students in crisis. This will happen via our newly reinstituted student care team. Many of you formerly know this as the student behavioral intervention team. Our focus is now on taking care of and supporting our students, and we wanted our new name to reflect that. The second is related to timely response to students in crises. I'm pleased to announce that this fall, LaGuardia instituted a full-blown crisis response team comprised of myself, Yvonne Gall from Public Safety, Celicia Hall from Public Safety, and two trauma-informed counselors who are part of our wellness center. The third focuses on college-wide communication and educative practices that inform student conduct and academic processes. I am equally excited to work alongside Dr. Boyana Blagojevich, Chair of the Department of Social Science, to facilitate a number of educative processes related to the work of our group on student conduct and academic integrity. The last focus is on adjudication processes. 
and their alignment with not only university policy, but institutional policy. And this will happen via our faculty student disciplinary committee. I'm also pleased to inform the campus community that for the first time in several years, the college's FSDC is fully staffed and ready to serve. Before I step away, I want to acknowledge members of the care team and crisis response team, working group on student conduct and academic integrity, and faculty student disciplinary committee. All of these groups will play an integral role in ensuring that students, faculty, and staff are informed of and supported by the processes and policies that govern our community standards. As you can see, a number of faculty, staff, and students from our community have agreed to serve, and we are grateful for their partnership. We look forward to the work ahead, and I thank you for your time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to present some highlights from our ACE Adult Continuing Education Division that happened during the summer and then follow up with some of our initiatives for the fall semester ahead of us. So the good news is our enrollment in ACE is up 5.7%. So yeah, you can clap. <laughs> which, is, which is an enrollment of 10,004. And this, is, this marks the third consecutive fiscal year of increased enrollment for the division. Extremely happy about that. And it also is a trend indicator of where we're looking towards the future. Enrollments continue to grow, particularly in non-credit courses. The numbers of adult learners in New York City we know are tremendously high, and the opportunities are multiple. In addition to that, there is a positive data point that I'd like to share with you. Uh, I'd like to call out that there are currently enrolled in this fall semester, 1,106 students in academic programs that previously started in ACE programs. Uh, I think that's an amazing, thank you. I think that's an amazing indication of the collaboration that you heard from our provost, uh, Vice President Rodin, and uh, Vice President uh, Alexis. Uh, about uh, working together in a collective community. Uh, this further means that we can further build those pipelines and build those pathways to increase enrollments across our college. And I would like to recognize Carolyn Nobles, our Senior Director of the CDC and the Satya Center for our hard work in connecting with our ACE alumni as they graduate and connecting them to enrollment opportunities at the college. Now, this summer, you may have noticed a lot of young students all over our campus. Now, some of them, maybe about 3,300 of them, were young students in our SYEP program, uh, ages 14 to 24. The SYEP program is a summer youth employment program. That's a program that is funded by DYCD, the Department of Youth and Community Development. This program is a hallmark of LaGuardia Community College. LaGuardia has a long-standing reputation as having the largest and most successful program. This program is critical in the fund fundamental foundations for young learners and young students as they get their first exposure to the world of work, their first explore, exposure to career exploration. And this program wouldn't be successful if not for Ms. Claudia Baldonado, our director of the Workforce Education Center. Now, also this summer, it seems like I got a lot of activity in ACE, but we also this summer, in the TELC, or the English Language Center, uh, led under the leadership of Senior Director Liz Iannotti, uh, had one of its highest summer enrollments. In fact, TELC had 761 enrollments this summer, with a total of 2,100 for this year. This is phenomenal. And, uh, <laughs> And, and TELC has played a critical piece in the puzzle of rebuilding the ACE division, and they've been fundamental in building back our enrollments. Uh, again, hats off to the TELC team, all of those involved, and thank you. Thank you, Heather and Liz and Magda. The su this summer, the Center for Immigrant Education and Training, led by Paula Michelin, recruited and trained 72 underemployed foreign-trained nurses. 
uh, in two NCLEX to RN English language learner training programs, and most recently graduated 32 students in a cohort funded by New York City Small Business Services. What's phenomenal about this program is that 85% of those who graduated in the, in the cohort from SBS were in placed in employment upon their graduation, and 77% of them uh, started earning salaries of at least $80,000 a year. Many of these same students were working minimum wage just prior to this. This is really transformational and an indication of how we serve our community at the college. I do want to give a big shout out to Professor Phil Gimber, who was a key partner in this. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. <laughs> and also this summer, we launched the Clean Energy Academy. This is a pre-apprenticeship program in partnership with uh, New York City Housing Authority. In this program, we are planning to train 100 public housing residents to upgrade NYCHA facilities, and these students will learn uh, solar panel installation, building electrification, heat pump, heat pump installation, and graduates who complete the program will gain stackable credentials and qualify for entry into union apprenticeships and construction trades. The very first cohort graduated this August, and a second cohort is just starting this September. A big shout out to Hannah Weinstock, Senior Director of our Workforce Development Unit and her team for a great job in leading this initiative. <laughs> so looking forward to the fall, our focus is on pro programmatic expansion, enrollment growth, and most importantly, meeting the needs of our students in the community. This fall, we're planning to launch an expansion of our technology workforce training programs into Manhattan for the first time at Civic Hall. Civic Hall is located on, in Union Square and 14th Street. This will give us a strategic advantage and opportunity to serve many New Yorkers who are working in the city and have not the ability or means to travel back to Long Island City to our mothership at the campus here. <laughs> Uh, we're collaborating with FedCap, a national nonprofit organization who has developed Civic Hall, and the very first courses of ACE programming will start October 30th in cybersecurity. Uh, this will allow us to even further engage uh, other adult learners in that area, particularly those working in the service sector around the, the area of Civic Hall, and connect us to further opportunities to expand uh, additional opportunities to recruit as well. This fall, ACE will be launching two new workforce initiatives in partnership with the Empire State Development. The first program is in collaboration with Local 52 of IATSE, the International Alliance of Theatrical and Stage Employees. Local 52 will provide film production training to our students and teach them the skills required to work as grips in film and television production. The second program, also with ESD, will, uh, uh, will allow our students to have experiential learning opportunities in the film and television accounting positions, a very unique opportunity for our accounting majors. This is in collaboration also with IATSE Local 161. I want to give a big shout out to Shandana Madaswamy, our Senior Director of our Career and Professional Training Programs, who's leading this initiative. And a very notable and new initiative that I'd like to share with you this, that is starting this fall is the LaGuardia Correctional Educational Partnership. Thanks to a private foundation grant that was awarded to the college, thanks to the president who was able to secure that funding, we are now able to create a new position whose main focus will be to reach out and serve justice impacted individuals in our communities. This is a position and a role that's been a long time coming and needed within our community. This individual will work across academic non-credit areas and work as a connector of our programs and provide services to the individuals who need help and also work with local CBOs. It has been a re remarkable summer and we are looking forward to an equally exciting fall. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the entire ACE Divisional team, all my team members, all my colleagues, uh, because they really make these programs successful. Thank you. The 
first goal is to strengthen and expand the LaGuardia brand and our position in the market to be really effective in reaching our top feeder schools and community-based organizations. The second goal is to create a more welcoming and enhance our services to immigrant communities as well as first-generation families because they make up quite a significant number of our applicant pool. Our third goal is to bring back more of our in-person events here on campus. Uh, these events have been quite successful in the past because they have been cross-divisional where students are able to meet with multiple offices throughout the campus and it was really a great opportunity for us to assist students and to share the academic excellence of our institution. My three goals for the semester are expanding collaborations with the four-year colleges and external industry partners, recruiting outstanding and diverse faculty, and improving the quality of education to ensure our students' success. Uh, the initial goal I have is to modernize paper-based procedures, thereby simplifying the process for faculty and students to access timely updates and information. My second goal involves establishing a collaborative approach with our faculty members, aiming to enhance practices and minimize disruptions within the college community. My third goal is to support our cross-divisional initiatives to reintroduce a comprehensive one-stop model that enhances both in-person and virtual student experiences. My three goals are one, to serve more students, especially new arrivals to New York City. Number two, to provide more professional development activities for our faculty. And number three, to build in more of a focus on inclusivity in both our classrooms and in our offices. And important for all these goals is to have fun. We lost a lot of fun during the pandemic and we need it back. Work is work, but it should also be fun. Thank, thank you, everybody, for being here on this warm, sunny, beautiful, <laughs> spring-like day, Ben. Thanks, seriously, for coming, and thanks to all who tuned in. Apologies for uh, some of the technical issues at the beginning. Thanks again to our American Sign Language interpreters. Have a great fall semester and a lovely afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>